Okay, hello everybody. It's going live. Okay. Well, I'm going to start today. Hello, Letiza. How are you from Italy? I'm going to start with some questions that were asked at the um, at the last session. I always read over what you ask. Um, hello, Tarun. Um, so this is from Thomas, and I'm sorry if I don't pronounce your, your name correctly. This is from Thomas Gucci. And he was asking, what pigments are substitutes for cadmiums? Hello, Agus. Um, and he uses pyrrole red, which is one that he, he enjoys. So Thomas, uh, you can use many of the pyrroles um, to simulate the cadmiums. And those can be the um, cad red, um, pyrrole orange. So the pyrrole red acts for the cad red medium, pyrrole orange for the cad orange. And then your question for the yellows um, you can use uh, many of the Hansas to simulate the um, CAD yellows. Uh, the difference between those and using our CAD U's is our CAD U's have very high um, opacity and uh, they're great in mass tone. Hello, Ethel from Philippines. Raffaele from Italy asks about lunar earth and his question on lunar earth is, is it a single pigment? And yes, the answer to that it is a single pigment. It's PB, which is pigment brown number 11. So PBR11, pigment brown number 11. Hello, Claudia from Mexico. And Carolyn from Scotland, very nice. Frank is from Morocco. Uh, Scott Stevenson. So Scott Stevenson asked the question, what is the difference between perylene and quinacridones in their chemical structure? So I'll just tell you real quick and then I will send you um, some sheets that actually show you the chemical structure. So Scott, to answer your question briefly, uh, quinacridones are a five ring structure, whereas um, perylenes are seven ring structures. And I will send you more information since you seem to like that. Hello, Scott. Uh, Mel Citrin. Are there chemical similarities in different pigments that reflect the same color? Um, it's really all about, Mel, what gets absorbed and what gets refracted or reflected. Um, it tends to be if a chemical structure is symmetrical, it happens to have a better light fastness. And the rationale behind that is somehow that um, symmetrical shape gives better protection against UV light. Um, additionally, chemical structure really doesn't have a whole lot to do with uh, the color you get from, pig from similar pigments. And it comes back to what we talked about last time. If we take ultramarine and French ultramarine, PB29, pigment blue number 29, they are exactly the same pigment. Um, they have roughly the same shape. The difference becomes in the particle size. And because the particle size is different, you have the French ultramarine shifting warmer red and the ultramarine shifting cool or green. Um, a similar um, situation will exist in PV19, pigment violet number 19. Hello, Linda Dahl. And uh, uh, so PV19 is also quin rose, quin red, and quin violet. And same exact pigment, same, same rough shape, but different chemical makeup. So it really comes down to not so much whether the particles look the same, but they're the characteristics that allow them to either absorb or reflect light. Um, US painters, hello, Erica Sonneman. It's all about 
pushing around light. It's all about physics. So these are really good questions. Um, Tammy um, Dolson asks, is there a plan for Primatech Yellow? And uh, somebody else also asked, um, Jamie asked about how Primatechs are chosen. So will there be yellows? Yellows is very difficult within the mineral world because most yellows are ex very, very transparent. They're very, very light colors. And the only ones that aren't light, for example, sulfur, is horrendous to use. It would be catastrophic to use. It's a beautiful color. Um, it's just horrible in its attributes. So yellow is very, very difficult. Um, you, can, you can get better, ye better yellows. We get better yellows when we use, for example, certain ochres or siennas. Um, you, get, you get better yellows from those. Those aren't quite classified as uh, minerals. Uh, and they're iron uh, containing um, clays, etc. cetera. Um, what is, and this is, this is I, I wrote some for myself here, I wanted to share with you. What is an organic pigment? So pretty much you have synthetic and natural, and you have organic and inorganic. Those are kind of the four categories. An organic pigment is any pigment which has an atom of carbon within its molecular structure. So if we had H2O, water, that has no carbon, that wouldn't be organic. Inorganic are those that don't contain a carbon atom. Now, it's chemistry, so it's not, there are um, exceptions. There are a lot of exceptions. And we call the exceptions hybrids. So there's some hybrid exceptions. Hello, Tanya from Georgia. Hello, George Solomon, a phenomenal painter. And Lauren McCracken. Um, so organic contains a carbon, inorganic doesn't contain a carbon. Um, inorganics are, tend to be brighter than um, organics. And so what's a hybrid? A hybrid would be the thalos, for example. This was asked last time about the thalos. Um, thalo, PB15, pigment blue number 15, uh, number 36, those contain a copper. So while it's a very long um, carbon string, it has a carbon. So it's considered um, to be or an organic, although it has a metal, which would classify it as an inorganic. People also talked about PB16, which is pigment blue number 16. Pigment blue number 16 was made without copper. So it is one of the thalos that is absolutely um, organic. So very interesting questions. I love your questions. Um, I don't always get to them because uh, your um, comments go pretty quickly by, but I do read them over. And, um, I will always get back to you as best I can um, on an answer. Connie from Texas says, thank you for doing this. It's my pleasure to do this. Thank you for watching. I appreciate it. Um, Laura McCracken asks, what is the what is the brightest red, like a fire engine red? Um, Lauren, I will get back to you next week um, or tomorrow, but I'll let everybody know that question next week. Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I love Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, hello, Misha. Misha is from, um, from Russia, realist artist. So what I wanted to go over today, and next week I'm gonna go over the Primatex with you. Um, so any questions you have about Primatex, I have them all with me. Um, anything you want to see, um, let me know, and I'll spend uh, as much time as needed to go over those with you. So today what I thought we would do is look at the luminescent colors. I brought them all with me. They're um, in the back. I'm going to bring you back there in a moment, and we're going to take a look at them. Uh, 
Um, something I would use to protect uh, watercolor paintings in very humid region. You, there's um, different UV absorbers you can put on your paintings or you can put them behind uh, UV glass and then behind the painting itself, you can use a very, very small pack, a very small pack of, um, of uh, silicate that takes up moisture. And if they're real small and it would take up moisture that gets in between the glass and your painting and it would take it out. But you want to put it in the very back of it. Um, I can give you some other ideas too as I, as I spend more time um, reading these. Okay, so we're going to go over the Luminescent series. And remember the Luminescent series um, is the pearlescent, the, the iridescent, the interference, and the duochrome. And I wanted to go over some of those with you. This is a fantastic article. We put this article up. And I think you can read that. This article is actually posted. And it's about five pages. And if you haven't looked at it, it's excellent, um, excellent to read. It tells you about the different types of light. Um, and it goes over the luminescent colors in more... Um, more uh, depth and for those of you that like it it's it's a great article and it's right there on facebook um, under on, under my last uh, presentation so essentially when you have organics or inorganics um, those are um, they absorb light so it's light absorption um, so you're seeing a reflection when you have the metallics and the interference, you're seeing a di another type of light. So with the metallics, you're getting reflection. So metallics would be those that contain copper, those that contain aluminum, etc. And then you have the interference colors or the luminescent colors. And those are multi-layered. They're multi, multi-layered. And you get different types of um, light, uh, light effects. So with the interference, you're getting, because it's a multi-layer, and it's multi-layer because it's, uh, in some of them it's mica, in others it's titanium dioxide, and in others it is um, silica dioxide. And it creates like a, a, a big sandwich of colors. So when light comes through, it's, it's, it's absorbing, it's reflecting, it's scattering. So in general, because of the multi layers, you're getting refraction, reflection, and scattering. And I'm gonna show you this in a moment so you can actually um, see it in with the, the luminescent colors themselves. But it's very complex. It's way more complex than just an inorganic or organic, more complex than just a simple metallic. And it's because that multi layering, like a sandwich, that's called causing all of the light to do many different things. It's really beautiful. Um, before I go on, I touched all of the questions that you asked last time. Um, so someone asked about carbon black. Carbon black and lamp black um, are both organics. Whereas lunar black and ivory black um, all have iron or a metal in them. So they're, by definition, inorganic. When we look at the... I'm going to get up just a second. Excuse me. And I'm going to show this to you in greater detail in a moment. When we look at the... Uh, just the pearlescent, this is pearlescent, and this is pearlescent shimmer. So pearlescent and pearlescent shimmer. Uh, the only difference between these two is the particle size. And on the pearlescent shimmer, the particle is, is, is larger. And because it's larger, um, it tends to be brighter and more transparent. 
So it's just a particle size difference between these two things. So what I wanna do now is I wanna walk you over um, to see the uh, luminescent colors. I'm gonna to have to disconnect this for a second. Hello, Raffaele from Italy. I'm gonna disconnect this and then I will bring it back and reconnect it. So excuse me for just a moment. Okay. And okay. So these these are all of the luminescent colors. So there's 48 of them, and there's the, so let's go over a couple. This is a very pretty one. This is, this is iridescent electric blue. And so this is black, and this is just uh, regular watercolor paper. And what we do is we draw it across both sides. And you can see over white, you can still see that it's blue, but over black, you really get this sparkle. Let me show you the sparkle. Um, it better light, it'll sparkle even more. Hello, George Politis. So that's an example of an iridescent. A iridescent, you can still see on white. And let me give you another one. This is iridescent antique gold. Um, this is iridescent gold. Here's iridescent Here's iridescent topaz. So these are examples of titanium dioxide, silica dioxide, and mica. This is iridescent sunstone. See how they differ? See on one side, it doesn't look like it's any type of a, of a copper. It's more of a, um, a light brownish, almost like a little pipe stone. And that this one here, when you put it over black, it really pops this other color, it really pops this gold. And you can see if I turn it, you can still see some of, you can still see with some of this color in here, depending on how I turn it and how I present it. So it's all how I present it. You can see the different colors. Um, here's an iridescent scarab. Totally different between this and between this. And it's the same paint, it's just been put over black so you can see the difference. And as you move it, you can still see, you can still see some of, you can still see some of this in here. See, you can still see it. And it just depends on how you, how you move it. So it would, it would be the presenter's eye when they're looking at it and as, as they move it, oh, you're losing me. There we go. Um, so the next one, next set is interference. So I'll show you some interference. And interference are pretty easy to denote because they're very hard to see over just watercolor paper. Very hard to see. This is being painted over watercolor paper. So you can see it very light, very light. But when it's over black, it really, or not black, dark green, dark blue, anything dark, it's really gonna pop. It doesn't have to be black. I mean, it's really gonna pop. And interference. 
So if you put, if you put an iridescent over your watercolor paper, you're going to see it and you'll see its counterpart. If you wanted not to see that, if you used interference, you won't see it, but over anything dark, it's really gonna pop out at you. So that's an easy way to see interference versus iridescent. Let me show you some other ones. So here's iridescent moonstone, iridescent moonstone. It has this very interesting granulation right here. And on this side, it has that shininess with granulation. So they're really colors that, you know, you can play with and get different effects from. I also tell people all the time, they're like lovers. So you wanna make sure that you're using a separate brush and separate water, because if you, dig, if you dip your regular brush in the water that you've just had the iridescent or luminescent colors in, you'll get that mica on your brush. Easy to get out of your brush, but all of a sudden you may say, why, why is my ultramarine shiny? And it's because you've put mica into it. Now maybe you wanna do that, but most times you don't wanna do that. So here's the next one, and the next one is called a duochrome. And it's called a duochrome because many times it shifts to two different colors. For example, this duochrome is cactus flower. And you can see it's one color here and it's absolutely a different color as its counterpart. And again, that's that, so that's that difference in uh, uh, mica, silica, or um, titanium dioxide. Do you mean over black watercolor paint, over black watercolor paper? Um, it doesn't matter if you do it over a dark, um, this is Connie. Connie, if you painted it over a blue or a green or um, any, any color that's, that is more, doesn't have to be opaque, but like semi-opaque, you're absolutely gonna see that um, iridescent or luminescent color really kick in. If you put it over black paper, absolutely, it's just gonna pop. Um, or any dark colored paper, any dark colored paper, any semi-opaque or opaque color, it's super gonna pop. A lot of artists are, again, putting it inside of the, um, the eye. Uh, Claudia does that from New Mexico, or from Mexico, I'm sorry, and it's just gorgeous. It, it brings the eye alive. I wish I'd have taken some images of her eyes that she paints, they're just, they're just gorgeous. So let me show you some more duochromes. This one is desert bronze. So you can see you can see some of you can see some of the green in here when I move it. You can see some of the green right in here. See it? But over here, you know, you get both. You get the the brown and you also get this green. And depending on how you move it is what you get. Um, let me show you another color. Uh, so this is this is duochrome green pearl, du duochrome green pearl. And let me show you, yeah, the duochromes, each one is different. So each one can be used um, depending what you wanna put in your toolbox. Uh, to get the effect that you want to get. So let me bring back the shimmer. So there's the shimmer, iridescent shimmer. And this is the pearlescent white. Again, the only difference is particle size. When you look, this one tends to be, if you just, you can see this one is actually pops more than this one, and that's because the particle size is larger. So Joey's asking, is this over any dark? Yes, almost any dark is gonna have the iridescence pop, um, and that's because um, of the titanium and the mica and the um, scattering of light and the refraction of light. So 48 for you to choose from. 
Someone asked last time, are they available in five mil? There is a Gene Haynes set that has six of them in five mil. Um, there's also a 238 dot card that you can purchase that has all of them as dots. So if you wanted to practice or just see what they look like, you could do it. The thing with the, the um, when these dry, to, they will re-wet. All of our paint will, will re-wet. But these are kind of like shingles on your roof because those mica are like little shingles and they can get tight. So you wanna, you know, Lauren had a really good idea, which is to spritz them with a little bit of warm water, or you can just put a little bit of water on them and wait for a couple of minutes, and those, those mica will start to release, and it becomes very easy to paint with. Yeah, there is trouble with the feed, and that is, be, uh, it, it's, there's so many people, uh, right now, literally the world is on the internet, and when I move the camera, it also uh, probably affects you. Okay. Can you mix them with regular watercolor? Absolutely. Um, anything that you mix these with, again, it's gonna have that mica in it, and therefore it's going to sparkle. So you really kind of wanna, you want that effect. Um, and if you don't wanna have it go over your entire painting, you just wanna isolate your brush and is isolate the water you're using and the palette that you're using. And they clean off very, very easily. Okay, so I'm gonna take you over to one more thing. And this is a question I get asked about a lot. Um, these, this is watercolor ground. And watercolor ground comes in, comes in five different flavors. And you can take it out of this bottle and put it on anything. You could put it on paper, any paper, you can put it on cardboard, you can put it on candles, you can put it on pie dishes, and in about 24 hours, when it dries, um, it's, it becomes a, uh, a watercolor substrate, so you can paint on it, just like you would paint on paper. You can paint on this lamp, Tansu, you could paint on the walls, the door, you could paint on shoes, you could paint on everything. It takes about 24 hours for it to cure, and then what you have is a watercolor substrate. We did this because a lot of artists, if you're an oil colorist or an acrylic artist, you could pretty much paint on anything, and this was a way to allow watercolorists to be able to paint on anything. You could also take a brush or a sponge, and you can lift up by just touching, and it gives this, I don't know if you can see it here, it gives it this, oops, it gives it this texture, so you can add texture to anything. So it's really a matter of being as creative as you want to be. What we try to do at Daniel Smith is, is give you as the artist a number of tools that you can put in your toolbox um, to use as you see fit. Some people love this. Um, I know um, some are using it to put into shows. Um, it's, it's just fun to play with. It's a fun thing to play with. Let's see, I'm gonna answer some of your questions. I'm sorry, I'm gonna turn around here real quick and come back. Let's see what questions you have. Ah. And bring my light back. And there we go. Okay. So next week, next week we'll go over the Primatex. Um, please send me any question you have on the Primatex. I think what I'll do is um, I will start taking images of my machines uh, in manufacturing. So when I talk about a three-row mill, you can actually see what a three-row mill looks like. Um, I have been doing what's called in the artist studio and I've been calling um, uh, artists that I know all over the world. The one that I'm putting on today is Alvaro Castanet and he will be on um, our Daniel Smith YouTube channel as well as Facebook. And what, I've, what I'm trying to show is artists in their studio, um, how they paint, 
um, their, their tips, their techniques, what brushes they use, why they use them. They've been, um, I've done 20, 28 of them. Um, they've been phenomenal. Uh, they're so sharing in um, uh, of what they've learned over decades. And I think you might find them really interesting. They're very short, um, but I think you would find them very, very interesting. What are the newest colors? The newest color that we have is the PB15, which is the Thalo Turquoise. Um, while we always have lots of colors that we're working on, um, I don't bring them out all the time, and that's because it's very difficult for retailers. Um, changing one color means they, they change anywhere between 77 and 260 colors on their racks. So I try to make it where I bring out a reasonable number. Um, before the uh, Thalo Turquoise, I had brought out the um, Alvaro Grays uh, which, which, and Joseph Grays, which are beautiful grays, beautiful, beautiful grays. Um, and so we're always working on colors. I mean, it's what we do. I have a full time, a full laboratory. Um, I have two chemists and my chief is always working on colors. Where do we, where do I find those videos? Uh, Joy, they're right on the, um, Facebook page under where I'm going to post this. You'll see them. And, uh, they're also, uh, done on YouTube. And what I'll ask the webmaster to do is to make sure they're really clear on the YouTube page. Thank you for asking that. Yes, Daniel Smith does have a YouTube channel. I'll ask them to put that there as well. Um, how many colors do you have in total? In watercolors, we have 260 colors. And on the new watercolor chart, you can see those. And I know the webmaster just made the watercolor chart that's online bigger, so you can also look at them there. Kick ass, light fast blue. Thank you, Misha. New colors are all back ordered at Cheap Joe. A lot of the new colors are, and it's 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 around the world, and it's just because um, for two weeks, at least two weeks, we were shut down in Seattle. Um, we could not ship, even though we have everything. It, it was a um, order by the governor. Um, those are gorgeous. Alvaro's Fresco is my favorite. Alvaro's Fresco and his Caliente are extremely popular. In fact, when you hear some of the, um, the artists that I, I had presentations with, they love it as well. It's, they are beautiful, beautiful grays. Um, Yes, uh, Angela says it's also on Instagram. Yes, they're, it's all, they're also on Instagram. Joseph's, this is Tess. Joseph's gray is something unbelievable. Yes, Alvaro's grays and Joseph's grays. Um, we spent months upon months upon months going back and forth with uh, the, both of those artists. They're wonderful artists. Getting it to meet their criteria. Um, how it would break, how it would granulate, how it would mix. Um, and I think they are truly wonderful. How do I get a new watercolor chart? Annie, any, almost any store can get you a watercolor chart. Um, we, we make those available. They would have to order from us, but we would send those out to them. We try to give them to society. So please ask your, um, ask your local store that carries Daniel Smith. They should have them. If not, they can get them. Um, Dick Blick, yeah, Dick Blick has everything that we carry. Um, they and Jerry's and several others actually carry a large supply in their, in, their, in their warehouse and distribution center, so they tend to have it when other people don't. Um, we love everybody that carries it. We, we're so appreciative of, of brick and mortar stores, etc. cetera. So, um, do you have factory tours? I do have factory tours. Um, they're very difficult for me because I have to, from a um, compliance stand, standpoint from OSHA and WISHA, um, I have to shut down my um, operation to be able to do a tour. And it's extremely difficult to shut down a manufacturing facility. Um, but when I have big groups, big watercolor societies, or I've had artists come in and do um, uh, group meetings, I, make, I, I open it up for that. But it, I, I, can't, I can't bring one person because I'd have to I should have to shut down my facility. It's very difficult. J. 
Janet means no problem. Love, love, Blunner. Yeah, the Lunar Blue is a beautiful color. When water color ground is there a sealer you can recommend after you've done a painting you know there's some uv and i can i will get back to you kim on that there's some uv product that you can spray over the top you just need to be careful because um watercolor being an aqueous medium you could accidentally re-wet an area and it might not look good so it's always best to test it uh to really make sure one of the easiest ways is to use uv glass um and then we're working on other ways to be able to do it. But those are probably the two best ways. I've been on a tour, remember that art teachers conference? Yes, the art teachers conference tour. Yeah, I always try to put it up for teachers because I think the more that we can have um, our young people understand, not be afraid of the chemistry and the physics and know that it's an integral part of the artistic process, it's better for all of us. Um, it's good for the science majors to understand the art side. It's good for the art side to understand the science side. It's just, it's a win-win all around. So I'm always very proud to do those. Can you do a video tour of the plant? I think what I'm going to do um, is do the machine so you see how each machine operates. I think it'll give, so probably from the paint recipe all the way to the final product, I'll show you over a series of weeks how I get there. Um, watercolor ground, can it ruin brushes? Do you have to apply it with an old brush? No, you can apply the, it's water miscible. So you, you can apply the watercolor ground with a brush and then when you're done, you want to, you know, you absolutely want to clean it through so you get all of the material out of it. You can also use a foam brush, it's easy to use. They're inexpensive, they're cheap, um, and they do a really good job. You can actually give texture or no texture with a foam brush. So that's something you can use as well. You don't have to use a Kalinske to use the uh, watercolor ground. Um, hello, Besnik from Kosovo. I um, did a film in the artist studio with Besnik. It's wonderful, he's a wonderful man, wonderful artist. A uh, very giving person. Will we see photos of your machines? Yes, you'll see photo th photos of the machines. Not only do I have uh, the manufacturing plant that makes the color, I have another manufacturing plant that produces the pigment. And that's a very, very interesting process in itself, and I'll probably show you that as well. Um, Raphael, I will give you information on the, on the geophyte. Does the interference and iridescent come on a dark ground? Yes, they do. So this is Tannis. Um, the 238 has all of the iridescent, all of the interference, all of the duochrome, and, and iridescent interference, duochrome, and pearlescent. It has them all. There's also a 66 dot card that has a, a reasonable proportion of them. So it, um, either one of those cards would have the um, luminescent colors. I enjoy doing the presentations, Kim. Thank you so much. Please, the more questions you ask, I really love it. Um, I love to be challenged. Uh, it allows me to grow and I love growing. I'm all about growing, so I love that as well. And... So next week we will be doing the Primatex. I'll show you the Primatex. So any questions you have about them, there were some really good questions um, last, last time about do we have a uh, Primatex yellow? If not, why not? Um, how long does it, take, does it take to make a Primatex? That's super interesting. Um, how do you source, source the Primatex? I'll go over all of those with you. Well, okay, let me just show you a couple more things. We're gonna, I'm gonna have two presentations. I do one for um, India and, 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 and that region of the world. And I do this one on Friday. So one on, on Thursday, one on Friday. Um, so let me hold this up for you to read it. Okay, so that's next week. Um, if you haven't read, go ahead and read the uh, three-dimensional aspect of the luminescent colors. It's wonderful. Um, I have the dot cards, the set of large sheets. 
Yes, the so, uh, Sylvia and the large, the large sheets, there's four pages of them. They would have just about everything, 238 out of 260. So next week at uh, Thursday at, at two o'clock and Friday at 10 o'clock, I'll be doing the Primatex. Does yellow jasper not make a good enough permit? No, yellow jasper is very, yellow in itself is usually very difficult. This is Debbie Cleveland. Yellow is very difficult because um, usually as minerals, they're very super transparent. So when I process them down um, into pigment, there's just no color left. Um, in general, it takes a lot of processing for a Primatech. You really have to um, condense it over and over. Um, or it can be quite light, so it's a lot of processing. Hello, Tarun. Could you run that date? Of course I can. Okay. Yes, that's Pacific time. Thank you. It's Seattle time, so it's Pacific time. Yes. Um, the next week, the, oh, yes, the next week is May 7th. Hi, Catherine. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, all the times are Pacific times. And, um, no, uh, we, we don't make colored pencils. Um, it's kind of not our niche. We really uh, focus on uh, watercolor, watercolor mediums, oil, oil mediums. Um, we uh, have, had, have had inks. Um, inks are very popular. We both have water-soluble inks and regular inks. But right now, it's, the focus is um, watercolors and uh, water-soluble oils and traditional oils. So on Mountain Time, you're an hour... I think an hour difference than, than Pacific time. So Pacific, Pacific time is just Seattle time for us. Yeah, the earth bluers, the earth colors are great in that they granulate so, so well. Moon glow is a phenomenal color. If you, if you like moon glow, you might want to try shadow violet. Moon glow is a red shift. Shadow violet is an orange shift. They're both quite beautiful, very granulating colors. How do color sticks work? Color sticks work, um, it's just a way to have almost like a pen in your hand. So you can paint over the paint at the tip. Um, you can draw it down and rewet it. What I will do, that's a great question. What I will do is not only will we talk about Primatex, I will go over watercolor sticks as well next time. So you see those. Um, Tannis, thank you for asking that question. I will bring those in so people can actually see them. Where can you purchase the dock cards? Um, depending where in the world you're at, uh, brick and mortar stores that carry our product have it. Um, uh, KDS in India has them. Um, here in the US, almost any of the internet dealers have them. Thank you, Tom. Um, Raphael, nine hours later, Rome time. Yeah, so I'm going to um, be leaving. I wanted to thank you all so very, very much. I think, uh, I think if you take a look at Alvaro's uh, video, you'll really love it. Um, he's a phenomenal artist, very passionate man. You can see that in his paintings. They're, they're full of passion and life, as are many of the other artists I've interviewed. Everyone has a different technique. And I think sometimes as uh, people that love our craft, the more that you can see from other people and, and the direction they take, it allows us to broaden ourselves. So I would really recommend you watch as many as possible. I think no matter which one it is, you will gain something out of it. All right, thank you all very, very much. I appreciate it. Um, again, ask questions, leave them on Facebook. I go over every single one of them and I will love getting back to you. All right, goodbye from Seattle. Thank you for watching.